After receiving Rachel's response, I quickly picked up my pistol and fired repeatedly at the butterfly sapling in the air. After being hit in the wings, the pained butterfly sapling emitted a huge cry and then summoned more tree roots. Fortunately, with Rachel's protection, these roots were easily severed, but the next second, Rachel was startled as roots from beneath the ground attacked me. Without hesitation, Rachel pushed me aside, successfully dodging the butterfly sapling's attack, but her foot was caught by the roots and she was thrown heavily to the side. Seeing this, I urgently called out to Rachel, wanting to know her condition, but in just an instant, many more roots targeted me. Just as I thought I was about to be severely hit, Kim Suho, enduring discomfort, blocked the attack for me. He confirmed that he had inhaled some of the powder. Noticing Kim Suho's poor condition, and with Rachel apparently unconscious on the ground, I didn't know what to do. Just as I was frantically pondering, Evangel's seat, inside my clothes, suddenly jumped out, looking very happy, and quickly attached herself to Rachel. Seeing this, I really wanted to pull Evangel's seat back, but I had to deal with the monster first. Kim Suho told me he could still help me for a while, but he probably wouldn't last much longer. My stigma's mana could only produce three fire attribute bullets, and I needed to kill the butterfly sapling before the bullets ran out. I then shared my plan with Kim Suho. Although the butterfly sapling were sprite-type monsters and very agile, to deliver a fatal blow, I would need to aim from a close distance. I planned to get close to the monster and needed Kim Suho to distract the butterfly. Hearing this, he immediately agreed. Then Kim Suho held nothing back and completely released the Sword Saint's magic power. Seeing the strong power he emitted, I realized that compared to the last time at the museum, Kim Suho had become much stronger. He was also observing me, and he remarked that no matter what secret techniques he showed, I always appeared calm. Not only that, I had even previously noticed Chai Nian's abilities. Sometimes he even felt as if I knew everything in the world. Kim Suho's words momentarily enlightened me. After speaking, he went to attract the butterfly monster. In his sword saint state, these roots were hardly a challenge for him. I also quickly moved towards the monster. My momentary daze was due to Kim Suho's perceptiveness, but I couldn't tell him that this place was actually a world I had written about in my novel, and I had become a character I had never written before. After quickly reaching the highest point, I fired a flaming magic bullet. This shot accurately hit the butterfly sapling's vital spot. Seeing the creature burning fiercely in the sky, Kim Suho was surprised because it was a fire-type attack. He was already struggling to stand. Fortunately, seeing me take action, Kim Suho thought it should be over soon. However, the butterfly larva in the air was still struggling violently, and the fireball did not kill it completely. The creature then controlled the roots to catch itself. Seeing this, I realized that the firepower was still insufficient, so I decided to fire another shot. However, before I could act, the butterfly larva was struck by a bolt of purple lightning. This time, the creature finally fell without resistance. The person who intervened surprised me. I did not expect the captain to come in at the critical moment and deliver the final blow. This made me suspect that she was after the butterfly's dust. Down below, Kim Suho looked at the creature, now on its last breath, and with one swift sword draw, he finished off the butterfly larva. Seeing the creature breathe its last, Kim Suho could no longer hold on and collapsed on the ground. At this moment, the captain approached the large butterfly, intending to collect the butterfly's dust, but I sternly stopped her from behind. I couldn't just watch the captain take it away. She still didn't know the specific functions of the butterfly's dust. It seemed the captain was here because the byproducts of the sprite could fetch a high price, but the butterfly's dust was crucial for Kim Suho. It could enable him to confront formidable enemies that would appear later, so I had to ensure he received it. Hearing my voice, the captain also halted. She glanced around. The other students had already been put to sleep by the butterfly powder. Although the sleeping effect weakened after the butterfly's death, as a student, I should have difficulty resisting the effects, but I had held on until now. Thinking this, the captain reaffirmed the mystery of Kim Hajin and decided to observe me more closely. I have been using the owner defense function of the ether to withstand the butterfly's dust, but I'm reaching my limit so I intended to put on my mask. But the captain suddenly attacked me, catching me off guard. As her magic enveloped us, a huge spherical barrier suddenly appeared around us. Inside the magic barrier, she revealed her true face and asked if I recognized her. Hearing this, my mind raced, and I feigned surprise, exclaiming, Are you Li Xiaopeng? At this, the captain was momentarily confused. She searched her mind for this name and soon remembered that it was a false identity she had used to get close to me before. The captain wanted to know when I had found out. I was about to say just now when she coldly threatened, If you lie, I'll kill you. But before she could finish saying kill, she changed it to beat you to death. Startled by her threat, I quickly said it was when we were fighting for the watch. Although this was also untrue, it was probably within what the captain would accept. I told her that I sensed something was off when we were in close contact, as my eyes are quite sharp. Yet the captain knew that Jane's ability could not be uncovered simply by having sharp eyes. Recalling that I could see through the perception blocking item in Jane's talent, she couldn't help but wonder if my mana was anti-magic. If so, that would make sense, because with inherent anti-magic, as long as the power is concentrated in the optic nerves, it indeed can be easily accomplished. If her guess is correct, then I am an invaluable talent that the chameleon troop 
cannot afford to miss. After she finished speaking, the captain lifted the magical barrier. As she slowly approached, I couldn't help but break out in a cold sweat. Unexpectedly, the captain reached out to give me the butterfly dust. Then she said, as a price, I needed to compensate, but she fell silent, unable to speak, as she didn't know what to ask for. At this point, Jane became anxious in the call and asked the captain to take her time to think. Quickly, she gave a perplexing answer, simply asking for my contact number. I had thought I was nearly in mortal danger, but it turned out to be a false alarm. Fortunately, I achieved an important goal. However, I now needed to find a way to give this to Kim Suho naturally. Once the captain left, I suddenly realized I had almost forgotten about Rachel and Evangel. When I turned around, I saw Rachel under the big tree, radiating golden light emanating from her chest. I immediately understood what it was. This was a sign of Evangel's birth. The next second, the immense golden light made it impossible for me to look directly. At this moment, the sleeping Rachel was thinking about quickly eliminating the spirit. However, the sudden bright light brought some consciousness to Rachel. In her dream, she saw a child and gently embraced them. The warm feeling seemed to be healing her wounds. Moreover, there was a familiar feeling about the child in Rachel's arms. If she were to describe the smile she saw, Rachel thought it was like her own in childhood. She seemed to hear the little girl speaking, but couldn't make it out clearly. Rachel wanted to ask her again, but the current Rachel was simply too tired. After fainting, she was still softly inquiring what Evangel had just said. The words Rachel wanted to know, I heard clearly, because Evangel affectionately called Rachel mommy and even recognized me as daddy. Some time later, when Chai Nian woke up, she just happened to find the examiners and I was moving the fainted Kim Suho and others. After the chaotic fourth day passed, it was the fifth day. All students were safely sent back. Thus, the dreaded final exams ended as scheduled. The appearance of the butterfly sapling also caused a stir among the examiners. After consultations, they unanimously decided to allocate the killing points to four students who successfully repelled the monsters. I've been waiting on the ship ever since, but the captain didn't contact me, making me curious why she was interested in me. While I was pondering this, Chai Nian suddenly interrupted me, wanting to know how I finally managed it. It turned out that Chai Nian learned from Kim Suho that it was I who had broken the butterfly's wings. How could a small handgun possibly do that? Hearing this, Chai Nian agreed. She initially wanted to ask about what happened at the end, but I was the first to ask, why did you use a sword instead of a bow and arrow at that time? Chai Nian was completely shocked. Wasn't it you who told me to use it? I explained that using a weapon she was not proficient with in actual combat could be very dangerous. Chai Nian told me not to worry because she was not so clumsy that I would need to worry. Next, I wanted to know how she felt after using the sword. Seeing Chai Nian turn her head away, I couldn't help but question. It seems you are still a bit scared, aren't you? She hurriedly defended herself in a panic, but it was clear that Chai Nian was lying. I then smiled faintly. Practice more in the future and you won't be scared anymore. After all, you are a natural born swordsman. A few days after returning to the academy, Yuyona, while eating in the cafeteria and hearing about Chai Nian's experiences with me, also expressed surprise. Kim Hajin must like you. Then she also asked for Kim Suo's opinion. He also thought that Yuyona made some sense. The continuous teasing from the two made Chai Nian feel her whole body heat up. Yuyona was asking her what she planned to do next when she turned around and saw me buying something. Hearing Yuyona call me, Chai Nian hurriedly turned her head to dodge. Seeing it was Kim Suho and the others, I also greeted them. After glancing at Chai Nian, who was visibly uncomfortable, I turned and left. But just that one look made Yuyona reaffirm her thoughts. Chai Nian also didn't know what to do about it. A little while later, I returned to the dormitory. Hearing that I had come back from shopping, Evangel hurried towards me, happily calling out Daddy. I told her not to run around in the room. Evangel wanted to know where I had been, so I told her I went to buy food. After picking up Evangel, I discussed with her whether she could stop calling me Daddy and call me Hajin or Uncle instead. However, little Evangel did not agree. As for why she was in the dormitory, it all starts from the day she hatched. At that time, Evangel asked me why Mommy was asleep again. At first, when she called me Daddy, I was wondering who she was calling. It turned out Evangel was calling me. Just then, the examiners came to check on the aftermath of the battle, and I asked her if she could turn back into a seed. Evangel wanted to ask about Rachel's condition, so I tricked her a bit, and she obediently turned into a seed. Just like that, I successfully brought her to the dormitory. Evangel is very well behaved when eating, looking indeed like a miniature version of Rachel. After letting her eat quietly, the next step was to deal with the butterfly's dust. Butterfly's dust can adhere to things with magical properties. It helps awaken their hidden potential. Simply put, whether it's people or objects, butterfly's dust can activate their potential. It should have naturally ended up with Rachel and Kim Suho, but because of the captain, now I had to find an opportunity to pass it on to them. Meanwhile, in Rachel's dormitory, she kept thinking about the child she saw. She could clearly feel the other person, and even after waking up, her hand still retained some warmth. Rachel thought it might be a creature like a tree sprite, or perhaps it was just a hallucination. But recalling the smile from her dream, she couldn't help but feel happy, continuously reminiscing about that warmth, as if it was telling her that they would meet again someday. A few days later, the school sent out a message about a guild tour.
ensure that students that are included in the list given by the guild will be contacted via their smartwatch. During the holiday, they could visit the guilds and observe the work of current heroes. High-ranking domestic guilds have the right to specify the students they want, but each guild can only choose three students from first and second years. Therefore, it is difficult for first-year students ranked outside the top 300 to get an experience opportunity. I was also curious about what heroes do on a regular basis. Besides the missions I had written about in the original novel, they must have other things to do. Unfortunately, my school ranking is very low, and even if I do well in the final exam, I can't break into the top 300. So, this guild experience probably isn't going to happen for me. Just as I was thinking this, the ringtone from my watch made me quite puzzled. Surprisingly, a guild contacted me. After slowly opening the message, I saw an invitation from the essence of the straight. After the holiday, Yuyona was waiting for someone on the road. Soon after, I also arrived there. Seeing me, she was very happy, having thought I would refuse. Yuyona mentioned there was another person, but they would be a bit late, so she suggested we go ahead. I then followed Yuyona to set off. On the way, she commented on my good performance at the finals, but in the end, I only scored 67 points. After driving for a while, Yuyona announced that we had arrived. I couldn't take my eyes off the building above us as I slowly looked up. Yuyona then welcomed me to the essence of the straight. Entering the building, there were many people inside, all busy with their own tasks. Although it's nominally a hero experience project, some work still needs to be done indoors. More challenging tasks require analysis before they can be strategized. I understand now why a low-ranked person like me still received an invitation from a major guild. It seems to be Yuyona's decision. As the guild leader's daughter, she would have that authority. We soon arrived in front of an office, precisely the analysis room of the essence of the straight. The person who brought us here is Park Sangho, an intermediate and advanced grade hero in the left hand of Yuyona. He heard that I ranked first in theoretical scores, so he brought me to the analysis room. However, although Park Sangho appears to be a gentleman, he is actually a sinister person and will later betray Yuyona. At that moment, a woman's voice came from behind. The newcomer was Li Jina, another intermediate and advanced grade hero who spoke sarcastically, saying it's surprising that a student ranked 934 could experience the essence of the straight. Li Jina's remarks were aimed at Yuyona. She aligns with Young Hoziok, the vice captain of the essence of the straight, while Yuyona, being the guild leader's daughter, is the rightful successor. Naturally, Li Jina sees her as a thorn in her side. This is only temporary, as she will later become a subordinate of Yuyona and eventually rise to the position of vice captain. However, her current remarks are still annoying. Li Jina then looked at some documents in her hand and came up with an idea. She challenged me to solve a problem in the document if I was confident and even called me kid. Li Jina succeeded in provoking me, so I asked her for a few sheets of paper to use. She continued to mock and snicker. Just then, Yona received a message that the last person had arrived. They then went out together to meet them. As for me, I started reviewing the documents. They contained variables that could occur when raiding a dungeon. I possessed the talents of observation and browsing, and such problems can be solved in a matter of seconds for me. Next, all I need to do is write the final analysis conclusion, and this document will be completed. But just as I was about to finish, Li Jina disdainfully took the documents away, urging me to give up and leave already. But I went downstairs anyway. Unfortunately, I hadn't written the conclusion yet, and I definitely wouldn't tell Li Jina if she later asked me for it. When the elevator doors opened and I had just stepped out, I unexpectedly ran into Chai Nayun. The next second, she finally reacted and then asked Yuyona why I was also here. Then I understood that the last person was Chai Nayun. But why hadn't Yuyona told me? Meanwhile, in Eugen Yuk's office, he looked very troubled because after a whole month of collecting, he only had a few pages of information about Kim Hajin. Eugen Hyuk hadn't anticipated the difficulty of the task. No matter how he spied during these days, he couldn't dig deep into who I had contact with before, not even knowing who my parents were or why I became an orphan. But one thing he found during this period caught his attention. Elsewhere, after everyone had arrived, Park Sang Ho took us to experience an activation mission. Before receiving the activation orders, we needed to wait here for a while. At this time, he also asked Chai Nayan why she was late. Hearing that Chai Nayan had gone to visit her grandfather, Park Sang Ho was very excited because her grandfather was the great hero Chai Jukyo. Yuyona received a message and said we should go on ahead, needing to take a call first. After reaching the restroom, Yuyona picked up the phone, and the caller was her uncle Eugene Hyuk. She then inquired about the status of the last investigation. Since the results were too scant to save face, Eugene Hyuk evasively claimed he hadn't started the investigation. His words also made Yuyona very angry. Following this, Eugene Hyuk wanted to know why his niece wanted to investigate the parents of Kim Hajin, or rather, if Kim Hajin really wanted to find his parents. Hearing this, Yuyona told her uncle that she thought so. Given that Kim Hajin had memorized the wanted list, speculating that maybe my parents were involved in some criminal case. Upon hearing this, Yu Jin Hyuk went silent because he associated it with the matter that concerned him. He then found a casual excuse to hang up the phone. Yuyona wanted to ask him when he would start the investigation, but the phone had already
already been hung up. On the other hand, Yu Jin Hyuk was very somber, wondering if Kim Ha Jin was really related to that incident, a 16-year-old case. At that time, at the Gwango Fortress area, 87 civilians who took refuge in a shelter, along with 9 heroes who were protecting them, were all killed. A few years ago, when Yu Jin Hyuk investigated this matter, he was caught and subsequently driven out of the Yu family. Although the final interpretation of the incident was that it was the work of Jin's, who personally investigated, understood that three significant figures were involved. One was the leader of K-Country at that time, Kim Siako. Another was the chairman of the Daehun group, Chai Jukyo, and Yu Jin Hyuk's own elder brother, also Yu Yona's father, Yu Jin Yong. Instead, they hired assassins, reflecting the trivial extent of their concern for the incident. The more Yu Jin Hyuk thought about it, the deeper his concern became. If Kim Ha Jin was a surviving victim now embarking on a revenge plot, it would be too dangerous. He understood that this matter needed to end here. If the investigation continued, once the crazy old man Chai Jukyo noticed, Yu Jin Hyuk would die a terrible death. Back at Essence of the Strait, after waiting for a while, we finally received the order to eliminate the appearing stone golems. Due to their speed, Park Sang Ho noticed I had disappeared. Regarding this, Chai Nian told him not to worry, saying I would catch up on my own. As for Yu Yona, since coming back, she had been gloomy, and she was very upset and sighed due to her annoyance with her uncle. Soon, several people arrived at the scene, where many golems were already causing massive destruction. A couple who couldn't escape were about to be killed by the golems. However, Yu Yona's whip arrived in time, and seeing this, Park Sang Ho immediately stepped forward, and then threw his spear at the golem. The next second, the golem was shattered into pieces. Just then, I finally arrived at the scene, and Chai Nian had also found her target. Quickly making a decision, Chai Nian decided to challenge this golem with a sword. She already knew the golem's weakness, so, she aimed at the monster's ankle, but the distance was too close. The golem's reaction was unexpected, and before Chai Nian could strike the weak spot, she was hit in the abdomen by the golem. The powerful blow threw her to the ground. Struggling to stand up, Chai Nian didn't expect the golem to move so fast, and its attack was not over yet. I urgently told her to get away, but with a loud bang, I was stunned because I had already pulled Chai Nian towards me using ether. That reaction was instinctive, and now I had to say something, otherwise it would lead to misunderstandings. Next time you can keep some distance. After all, your sword can become longer than a spear. Hearing this, Chai Nian admitted that she had let her guard down, and asked me to watch carefully next time, but then she also said thank you. The reason Chai Nian serves as a swordsman is because her mana capacity is several of times that of a normal hero. Chai Nian's talent, known as the Mana Sea, even surpasses Kim Suo's magic. When she uses a sword as a medium, her output has no limit. In the evening, we had dealt with all the petrification golems. After the rescue team arrived, we prepared to leave. But at that moment, I suddenly sensed someone watching from behind, and using my thousand mile eye, I saw her face clearly. Her features also allowed me to recognize her instantly. It was Tomer. Hearing Chai Nian and the others telling me to leave, I did not stay any longer. I felt only a moment of regret, as in the original story, the ether should have belonged to her. That night, in the office, Li Jina finally finished her work. She picked up the document I wrote, ready to evaluate it. However, after only a brief look, Li Jina was stunned. She hadn't expected me to do so well, but not having the analysis results made Li Jina very curious, and she directly contacted me. I want to talk to you, but knowing how the guild operates now, I have no more business there. So, I messaged Park Sang Ho that I couldn't go over. Seeing him ask why, I decided to tease Li Jina, and then sent Park Sang Ho the reason for not going. Someone mocked me as a low-ranking nepotist. After seeing the message, Park Sang Ho knew it was Li Jina's doing. Seeing him upset, Li Jina quickly explained that she didn't intend for this to happen. I could almost picture Yu Yona blowing up at Li Jina. Having run around a lot today, I was also quite tired. Evangel had already fallen asleep early. There was still one thing I needed to do, and it was perfect timing while she was asleep. After covering Evangel with a blanket, I started to deal with the next task. I took out the previously obtained butterfly dust. Looking at the full bag of powder, it was clear that there was a lot more than I had anticipated. I divided the butterfly dust into three equal parts. Kim Suho and Rachel were certainly important, but I had to look out for myself too. I needed to seize this opportunity to become stronger. Tonight, I plan to use my share. Given my potential, using it on myself would be a waste. I plan to use this pile of butterfly dust to enhance the potential of the ether. Slowly pouring the powder down, the ether gradually absorbed it. All that was left was to wait patiently. Just then, my watch received a new message, unexpectedly from Chai Nian. She came to thank me again for today, but seeing Chai Nian say a but, I wanted to know what she would say next. After waiting a full 10 minutes without a reply, I took the initiative to ask her. Chai Nian was puzzled, so I simply told her to go to sleep, ending the conversation. This inexplicably bizarre chat initially felt like a waste of time, but on second thought, it was quite novel. It seems I have now transitioned from a mere bystander to a character with a role in the story. Meanwhile, Yuyona was still working late into the night. Even at night, there was still much to handle. She decided to create her own information guild. Rather than waiting on her lazy uncle, Yuyona thought it better.
better to take action herself. After writing the recruitment notice, she also received a call from Chai Nayun. It turned out that next Tuesday, she and Kim Suho were going to a seminar, so she asked if Yuyona wanted to join. Yuyona was about to decline, but upon hearing that Shin Jong Hak was also going, she changed her mind and said she would go. Chai Nayun had something else to ask. She inquired if Yuyona had seen the video of herself with the golem. Yuyona said she had. I saw clearly how you fell into Kim Ha Jin's arms. Hearing this, Chai Nayun became anxious and threatened that if the video were spread, she would never forgive Yuyona. After teasing Chai Nayun, Yuyona happily hung up the phone. As for Chai Nayun in the dormitory, she didn't expect that scene to have been exposed. While continuing to work, Yuyona soon received another message, learning that I had given up the guild tour because of what Lee Jina said. Yuyona immediately became angry and told Lee Jina to answer the phone right away. Because of their attention, I unexpectedly gained SP. The SP I've recently acquired are also quite substantial. When it's time for the ether to be activated, I plan to use up all the SP on it. In terms of physical strength, even though I work hard, I will inevitably fall behind others, so I need to enhance the power of my weapons as much as possible. Using the SP, I set up a skill called Random Enhancement System that can strengthen recognized equipment. Although the name Random seems unreliable, with my top tier lock, this skill is absolutely amazing. However, it's just uncertain whether it can be set successfully. As I spent SP and pressed the confirm button, the status window indicated insufficient SP, reducing the quality of the skill. But before I could be disappointed, my powerful luck once again played a role. In the next second the random enhancement skill was successfully set. The only downside is that the upper limit of the enhancement power decreased. Although the result was not perfect, considering the incredible effect, it was good enough that it could be set successfully. The reason I am in such a rush to get stronger is also because the main story will soon start once again. In the blink of an eye, a week of summer vacation passed, and I spent it all in hellish training. Although I invested all my SP in weapons, it doesn't mean I plan to give up physical training. After the ether was enhanced by butterfly dust last time, it unlocked some of its potential. After recent practice, ether had fully matured. Overall, after the potential of the ether was enhanced, my physical strength value increased by 0.7. Not only that, but it also added a feature for more realistic transformations of items. Overly complex structures take more time. I then materialized a dagger to thoroughly test it. Examining the ether dagger in my hand, both its appearance and feel are the same as a normal dagger, but as soon as I use the random enhancement skill, its power becomes formidable, easily capable of splitting the ground and breaking rocks. Although it falls short compared to ancient relics, its ordinary appearance is key. It can make people let down their guard. After all, no one would expect such high power from a dagger. Time quickly came to the day of the travel club activity. I told Evangel I was going out and would buy her something delicious when I returned. I also told her that she can only make animals with the spirit friend, and she mustn't make any humans. Hearing this, Evangel had no choice but to agree. After putting on the coat Rachel gave me, I said goodbye to Evangel. I then headed straight to the gathering. Meanwhile, in the palace of Country B, a butler named Henry told Rachel that she could rest easy from now on. After negotiating with the cube, it would send reliable officials to the training camp for protection. Regarding the person who saved Rachel, Henry inquired if the princess would mind if the royal guild contacted him separately. Rachel gladly agreed, knowing my strength was definitely not limited to my current ranking, and other guilds might have noticed me already. Although the royal guild isn't as famous as those in Country K, their advantage is having the right to early access, and Rachel also wanted to recruit me into her own guild. Meanwhile, Han Yan noticed that everyone had arrived, so he called everyone to head to Country B. On the way, Chai Nayan was completely overheated since she came in her school uniform today. However, noticing me, she wondered if I wasn't hot in a jacket in such warm weather. I replied that I'm totally comfortable. After teleporting, we arrived in Country B. Everyone was curious about the surroundings, and Han Yan introduced today's destination, the soaring Clancy Islet in the sky, which could also be reached by teleportation. Clancy Islet, unique to Country B, is made of floating stone and concentrates various money-related activities, such as various entertainment auctions and new product launches for investments and enterprises. It is undoubtedly Country B's Golden Island, and the main story will also unfold here. After arriving on the island, Kim Suho asked us if we had been here before. It was my first time here while Yuyona nodded yes to the question. As for Chai Nayun, she had been here once with her brother when she was 11 years old. Seeing Chai Nayun's mood shift from happy to downcast, Kim Suho asked her if she could introduce us to the place. Hearing this, Chai Nayun suddenly felt motivated. Soon after, Han Yan informed us that there was a major event on the island at 7 p.m. today, and the organizers were very welcoming of the cube students. Before the event started, he let us go have fun on our own. Chai Nayan raised her hand to ask a question, and learning that it was okay to visit the casinos, she urged us to go together. Quickly, our group arrived at the destination, which was filled with an air of luxury. Seeing everyone else exchange money to play, I also followed to the front desk. But the reason I waited for them to leave was that the server in front of me was Jane in disguise. After
After casually chatting with her, I left. I was aware of the coming of the chameleon troop. After all, at 7 p.m. a major event would feature the appearance of something special that would capture the world's attention. I've always been excited to come here because, with Hylock and the Thousand Mile Eye, making money here is a piece of cake. The incident will occur at 7 p.m., and I still have plenty of time. However, after making a considerable amount of money from playing around, I noticed Chai Nian sitting at a table. The person across from her must be the scammer Vert. Chai Nian was about to leave when she was provoked by Vert calling her a kid, so she decided to keep playing. According to the original story, in the next two hours, Chai Nian would lose all her money and end up crying in a hotel room. She would lose because everyone else at the table were con artists, subordinates of Vert. This guy is quite a significant character. Watching the frantic Chai Nian, I couldn't help but lament this easy mark. Actually, I don't really care how much this rich girl loses. What matters is that I've got my eye on something of Vert's. So, I took the initiative to approach and told Chai Nian to let me take her place. Not wanting Chai Nian to continue being an easy mark, someone beside pretended to have something to do and left. Then we sat down together. At the game start, the man beside me was curious why I wasn't looking at my cards. I didn't respond, because I didn't need to flip the cards to see them clearly. On the other side, Jane was reporting to the captain and wondered if she had exposed herself. Hearing this, the captain thought not, as she believed I needed to concentrate mana on my optic nerves to see through Jane's ability. Considering this, Jane also thought it made sense, since she hadn't felt any mana flow. Meanwhile at the table, as the betting rounds added up, my chips were quickly running out. Then Vert offered to bet my ring, recognizing it as a magical artifact, which was exactly what I had hoped for. Vert wanted to know what the ring was. Hearing this, I feigned a serious look and said it wasn't something I could discuss. Seeing this, Chai Nian, remembering my orphan status, thought it was a remnant left to me. So, she suddenly stood up and said she didn't want to play anymore. She didn't want me to lose the ring. I reluctantly pulled Chai Nian back down and reassured her just to watch, as I was definitely not going to lose. I declared the ring was precious, and if he wanted it bet, he'd have to wager his own bracelet. Hearing this, Vert happily agreed, thinking he had a winning hand, but it ended in his defeat. An irate Vert tried to accuse me of cheating, but after security confirmation, Chai Nian mocked him instead. After the affair, I successfully obtained the bracelet, an artifact that could restore magic. The true value of the bracelet was still unknown to Vert. By evening, Kim Suho and others had been waiting for a while. Yuyona was visibly upset when we finally arrived, but then noticed I had changed my attire, with Chai Nian carrying my things. Curious about where I got the money, Chai Nian eagerly shared the recent events with them. Just then, a man approached from behind, recognizing Chai Nian. Surprised to see him here, Chai Nian hadn't expected it. Yuyona curiously asked if the man was Kim Junwoo, a hunter from the Light Source Guild. Happy to be recognized, Kim Junwoo joined in our conversation, while the captain silently observed, then called over Jane. The next second, Jane emerged directly from the wall, and they were about to officially start their operation. Soon, many people arrived on Clancy Islet for an event hosted by the Roten Corporation. The most attractive part of the event was the legendary White Crystal. As the host gradually introduced the guests, a girl's arrival captured everyone's attention. It was Princess Rachel of Country B, who was elegantly dressed for the occasion. After passing through numerous media interviews, Rachel entered the event hall. She breathed a sigh of relief, not fond of the journey's noise. Just then, someone called her from behind. It was Zeeland, the current CEO of the Roten Corporation. His presence visibly upset Rachel, but she still inquired if preparations against the magic beings were in place. Zeeland assured her that Clancy Islet was the safest place now to host the party. The Roten Corporation had dispatched many top-tier heroes. Zeeland arrogantly claimed that as the Royal Guild's biggest sponsor, they ensured this event would elevate the guild to new heights. At that moment, Zeeland's malevolent grin was unmistakable, leaving Rachel increasingly worried. We had already entered the venue, and there was half an hour until the event started. Now I was puzzled. Why would the Roten Corporation hold an event in such a dangerous place? In my story, they are one of the most corrupt corporations. Although there are no jinns among the upper echelons, there are many villains as bad as jinns. The White Crystal would be a disaster in anyone's hands. Three significant jinns will appear. Silicon, responsible for the fight. Nade, in charge of transport. And the evil society's Kim Hakbio. With my current strength, trying to snatch the crystal is impossible. So I'll just watch the plot unfold from the sidelines, as other organizations will also join the battle. Just then, the captain approached to speak with me. Seeing her, I quickly greeted her. The captain said she was here to serve as a security hero. Jane, on the other end of the call, congratulated her on finally meeting her secret crush, which instantly enraged the captain. Seeing her reaction, I was startled. The captain explained that it was just her teammate speaking nonsense over the earpiece, but I had heard it too. While chatting with her, Kim Suho noticed the new arrival and asked me who the captain was. I told him the fake info I had about the captain and introduced them to each other. However, the recently arrived Kim Junwoo stepped forward, introducing himself first, then immediately wanting to know how the captain knew me and asking which organization's hero she was. Before Kim Junwoo got an answer, the event officially started. People turned their attention
attention to the sender, giving the captain an excuse to leave for her security duties. I wondered if Kim Jun-woo had sensed something. After the captain left, we continued our conversation. Rachel noticed where I was and also saw the clothes I was wearing. She hadn't expected me to wear the gift she gave me. The first act of the event was Zeeland's appearance. He introduced the precious treasure, the white crystal. This crystal, naturally formed by magic, had 480 pieces discovered so far, but its full power had never been harnessed. Excited, Zeeland told everyone that the Roten Corporation would demonstrate the true use of the white crystal. Meanwhile, Rachel kept observing the hall. Since the beginning, she had noticed unnatural men in black suits moving around. Initially, Rachel thought they were security personnel, but as their number grew, her suspicions increased. With so many people inside, she couldn't act rashly. Just then, my getting up caught Rachel's attention. With the event still going, Rachel was puzzled by my departure. She couldn't help but think that I always appear at the scene of the crime, always giving off an unusual vibe. So, Rachel sent her bodyguards to monitor suspicious persons in the hall. After dispatching two guards, she slowly picked up her necklace. In the next moment, Rachel used this magical artifact to perfectly conceal herself. She planned to follow me first. In the hall, a man quietly listened to his subordinate's report. After investigation, the crystals in the Clancy Hall were confirmed to be genuine. This man was Kim Hackbio from the Evil Society. Listening to Zeeland's grand promotion on stage, he couldn't help but marvel at how desperate the other was for money, wanting to prove to the VIPs that the crystals were genuine, then trigger a surge in stock prices for greater profit. Of course, Kim Hackbio understood that the Roten Corporation was very confident about the island's security. After all, it was an island formed by magic, inaccessible to jinns via conventional portals, and the only portal was heavily guarded. But in Kim Hackbio's eyes, these preparations were inadequate, as they had also mobilized aerial transports today. He then ordered everyone to commence their operations. Elsewhere, I was slowly heading to the top floor of the hall, with Rachel increasingly curious about my destination. Soon, I reached two large doors, but they were locked. Rachel didn't understand the significance of me going to the rooftop, especially since it required a key to open the doors. She thought I might be persuaded to turn back. Unexpectedly, I pulled out a small hammer, leaving Rachel, who was hiding, dumbfounded. Weapons were prohibited on Clancy Island, but these tools were allowed. Rachel couldn't understand how such a hammer could smash through an alloy door. However, as the sound of the door shattering echoed, she was shocked silent by the scene before her because I had smashed the door into scrap metal without even using magic. But before Rachel could recover, there were many screams from downstairs. The hall was now in complete chaos. Guests were being brutally attacked by jinns, and Zeeland had been captured by members of the evil society. He hadn't anticipated that jinns would drop from the sky. Nade, having obtained the crystal, mockingly thanked Zeeland, but as he was about to leave, he suddenly sensed a danger behind him. The next second, a violent explosion erupted in the hall. The high-ranking hero Jin Xiangchen was surprised, as the opponent not only dodged his attack, but also had the annoying ability to clone himself. He had expected the Jin to confront him directly, yet Nade immediately fled with eight clones. Seeing this, Jin Xiangchen was baffled and reluctantly chose one to pursue. The captain, watching everything from the shadows, saw not only Jin's emerge, but many monsters as well. Kim Suho and Chai Nian were struggling to defend themselves. Someone called out to Chai Nian, and turning around, she saw it was Hunter Kim Jun Woo. The hall had been too chaotic, and they had been separated to deal with different Jin's. Finding Chai Nian and the others, Kim Jun Woo also tossed a sword to Kim Suho, which he had taken from a fallen Jin. While they fought, I stood alone on the rooftop watching. According to the story, Nade would split into eight individuals to escape. The first was being pursued by a hero in the east, but that clone didn't have the crystal. The south was covered by Jane, disguised as a Jin, but the crystal wasn't there either. Only one person was still pursuing a clone, the captain in the north. According to the original story, the crystal was indeed with the northern clone. As the captain pursued, she was ambushed by members of the evil society, attacked by multiple jinns. She calmly raised her hand and launched a magic sphere towards them. The jinns didn't take the seemingly fragile sphere seriously, but it voraciously consumed them upon contact. Hearing their comrades' screams, the other jinns realized they had kicked the iron plate, but it was too late to flee. The captain's move was both eerie and brutal. Nade, seeing his comrades consumed to debris, couldn't hide his terror, but in just a moment, he was hit by the captain's attack. From the rooftop, I witnessed this one-sided battle. Although the captain was a character I created, her powers were indeed too brutal. Just when I thought the crystal would end up in the hands of the chameleon troop as per the original storyline, the nade killed by the captain turned out to be a clone. The captain below was also perplexed. She had thought her judgment was correct. This scene made me unable to sit still, so I immediately opened my computer to see if the settings had changed, but I didn't receive any new messages, which meant that everything that had happened so far had simply led to a variation in the plot. Thinking quickly, I soon thought of a way to find the crystal, although I had never tried it before. However, there was no time to wait. I directed the stigma at my eyes, gathering magic power into them, and used Thousand Mile Eye to its full potential. Just as I expected, with the magic enhancement, Thousand Mile Eye was truly worthy of its name.
time. I quickly scanned the entire scene, but still, I couldn't locate the crystal. Fortunately, a speeding car caught my attention. Upon closer inspection, I spotted the crystal inside. But then, the image suddenly blurred, and my eyes started to hurt intensely. I realized this was the result of pushing Thousand Mile Eye to its limit, but with time pressing, there was no chance to rest. I immediately started to pursue. After jumping down to the ground, I spotted a parked motorcycle. Silently apologizing to the owner in my mind, I rode off on the motorcycle. Meanwhile, the battle inside the hall was spilling outside. Chai Nayun and the others were protecting guests as they left. As I rode by, I shouted out to Chai Nayun. Seeing she had no weapon, I threw her the magic sword I had acquired. Confused, she looked at it. I quickly explained the effects of the magic sword and reminded her to be careful before riding off without waiting for her to ask more questions. The special equipment stolen from Sidious changes its power based on the user's magic, so I figured the magic sword would perform far beyond demonic powers in Chai Nayun's hands. As I rode, I used Thousand Mile Eye again. Judging by the other's speed, I should be able to catch up soon. A few minutes later, the djinn on the vehicle had already arranged for a transport plane to pick them up, but just when they thought they were safe, I crashed the motorcycle into their car. The powerful impact flipped the car. After successfully stopping the djinn, I took a brief breather. However, a djinn inside the car wasn't hurt and kicked the door open. He came out arrogantly declaring my demise. Seeing the djinn signaling for help to the plane above, I realized he had backup. Consequently, I decisively took out my computer, checked the transport plane's number, and spent SP to alter the setting, making the plane return. The modification just completed. The djinn in front was dumbfounded as the transport plane flew away. Now no one could stop me. Next, I was ready to take the white crystal, but a whistling sound from behind made me instantly sense danger. In the next second, a terrifying magic power suddenly appeared, and an explosion erupted at the djinn's location. When I could see through the dust, the djinn from the evil society was already dead. The newcomer was Cheek Jung Young from the Chameleon Troop, here to snatch the white crystal. Cheek Jung Young's arrival made me very uneasy. Just as I was considering how to secure the crystal, the situation became even more complicated. I suddenly realized something was amiss because Cheek Jung Young was carrying Rachel on his shoulders. Now I understood the situation had gotten even worse. Immediately, I quietly let Ether slip out and then snatched the white crystal from the ground. Seeing this, Cheek Jung Young told me to put the thing down, but I demanded he release Rachel first. Hearing this, Cheek Jung Young finally realized I wanted the girl on his shoulder. He had thought Rachel was also there for the crystal, so he had brought her along. Cheek Jung Young was curious, is this girl that important to you? However, after saying that, he suddenly became interested and asked me whether it would be faster for him to twist Rachel's head off or for me to shoot the box. To this, I coldly stated, it doesn't matter who is faster, but if you don't put Rachel down now, you'll never get what you want. Cheek Jung Young hadn't expected me to be so tough, and immediately he threw Rachel to the ground while telling me to give him the item. Seeing this, I also threw the box over. After all, the white crystal was not something I could handle. The best option originally was to hand the crystal over to Rachel so it could be in the possession of the Imperial family. But now, the only choice was to use it as a bargaining chip for her release. I was curious about how Rachel had been captured, and I was waiting to ask her when she woke up, but Cheek Jung Young suddenly charged at me. All this happened in the blink of an eye, and I had no time to react to his attack. Cheek Jung Young did not hold back at all with his punch, but to my surprise, his strength stopped abruptly. At this moment, Cheek Jung Young was quite astonished and couldn't help saying, interesting. In Cheek Jung Young's eyes, I was very brave, facing his punch. I didn't even blink. Moreover, from the beginning, Cheek Jung Young had noticed that I was observing his movements, which undoubtedly matched the posture of a warrior in his mind. He withdrew his fist and said that I was not a hopeless case. As he turned to leave, Cheek Jung Young also expressed his admiration for me. As for me, I didn't say a word. Only when I was sure he had really gone far away, did I finally allow myself to collapse to the ground uncontrollably. I had almost died just now. This was the closest I had ever been to death. Cheek Jung Young's attack caught me completely off guard. If he had been even slightly dissatisfied with my response, I think my head would have already been blown off. In any case, I dodged a bullet this time. Just then, Rachel also woke up. The first thing she did was ask about the enemy. After I told her that the enemy had left, Rachel seemed confused. So, I recounted everything that had happened and asked if she was also after the crystal. Unexpectedly, Rachel had followed me here. She showed me a bullet and asked if it was mine, saying she had found it during the final exam. Upon hearing this, I realized it was a shell that had fallen during a long-range sniping, and I admitted it was mine. But just as I was about to take it back, Rachel pocketed it. She put the bullet in her pocket. She had come along this time because she was worried I might encounter the same kind of gin ambush she had. However, the enemy turned out to be much stronger than expected, which frustrated Rachel because she hadn't been able to help at all. After a brief silence, Rachel couldn't help but ask why I had helped her. If the midterm might have been a coincidence, this final exam was completely different. She could feel that I had been watching her ever since we disembarked. I couldn't tell her the real reason, so I made up my mind and then told Rachel, because I am your fan. She was totally not expecting that.
that. To make my story more believable, I even pulled out evidence of joining Rachel's fan club with a membership count of 10,000 people. Although this excuse was too fake, it was better than saying directly, you are a main character in the novel, and I can't just watch you die or get injured. If you are a fan, does that mean you like me? Hearing Rachel's counter question stunned me. After some time, the gins and monsters outside the hall had been dealt with. Looking at her damaged hair, Yuyona sighed deeply. Just then, Chai Nian hurriedly ran up, wanting to know if Yuyona had seen that thing outside. This inexplicable question left Yuyona unsure of what Chai Nian was referring to. In this battle, she indeed saw a lot, including the most eye-catching, hunter of light source Kim Jun Woo, who could blow up everything with his bare hands, and the sword Saint Kim Suho, who could sever anything. He effortlessly sliced through all enemy attacks. Chai Nian was even more surprising. After receiving the magical sword I gave her, Chai Nian who completely wiped the battlefield. She was also very satisfied with the magical sword I gave her. However, after hearing that Chai Nian was referring to Kim Hajin, Yuyona finally snapped back from her shock. She knew very well what Chai Nian meant. Yuyona had seen me riding a motorcycle out. While the two were still wondering where I had gone, Kim Suho hurriedly brought news that Rachel was missing. Chai Nian also remembered, after the fight started, she hadn't seen Rachel. Yuyona even suspected, could it be that the Jin's initial target was Rachel? Indeed, taking Rachel as a hostage, they could completely demand that country be transfer Clancy Islet to them. Thinking this, Yuyona couldn't help but curse the evil society as despicable and shameless. However, at that moment, someone saw a motorcycle approaching, and on it was the missing Rachel. Seeing her safe and sound, everyone breathed a sigh of relief, but Chai Nian noticed that this was the motorcycle Kim Hajin had just ridden. Considering this, Yuyona thought, while everyone was dizzy from the accident, I had ridden the motorcycle to another place. Afterwards, Rachel came back riding that bike. Doesn't that mean I single-handedly defeated the Jins and then rescued Rachel? She couldn't believe it was true. There were many experts among the Jins, and I was so tired, I just wanted to go back to the dorm to rest. And thus, this part of the main story had concluded. There was a dinner planned for the next evening. At that moment, Chai Nian was waiting for someone. When I arrived, I only saw her alone and learned upon asking that I had come too late. The others had already gone to the restaurant. Chai Nian urged me to hurry over, as today she was treating everyone to a meal. I found this quite curious, wondering if something had happened. After walking for a while, she suddenly stopped, her face showing an unusual tension. Chai Nian stopped me. She had a question she wanted to know, which was whether it would be okay for us to be friends. Chai Nian's words caught me off guard, but after thinking it over, I replied that it wouldn't be possible and told Chai Nian that we couldn't be friends. Hearing this, she clenched her fists and then said she was just speaking off the cuff. Chai Nian also thought that I looked down on her. Seeing her leave angrily, all I had left was silence. After all, we really couldn't be friends, because sooner or later I would have to leave this world, and I would need to kill her closest person. So, becoming friends was out of the question. Another day passed, and we returned to the cube. Seeing that I had finally come back, Evangel ran to greet me, bouncing around and asking if I had brought something tasty. After receiving the two fried chickens I bought, she happily thanked me, and seeing this, I felt a wave of relief. This feeling of peaceful times was nice. With something to eat, Evangel should be quiet for a while. With only three days left of the holiday, I needed to wrap up the unfinished business. The first step was to start with the linked smartwatch, as having to open the laptop to check every time something unexpected happened was too troublesome. I had refrained from modifying it before to save SP points, but after Cheek Jung Young's recent appearance, I had gained enough SP, and today was perfect for syncing the laptop and the smartwatch. With that done, only one important task remained. When I returned to school, I contacted Park Suhyuk. I asked him to get me a motorcycle. At that time, Park Suhyuk found the best performing bike, and I told him to go for the top configuration. Although Park Suhyuk was shocked, because the top model is very expensive, after I confirmed again, he said he would order it right away. I won a lot of money on Clancy Islet, so the money for the motorcycle was not a big deal. Besides, the Pack Horse Masters is about to raid the Den of Devils in City X, and once they go public, the stocks I bought before will skyrocket. Thinking about this, I couldn't help but feel happy. On the fourth day, the one-month summer vacation also ended. When I came back, I heard everyone talking about social media, and I remember that it had been a long time since I had checked the main group's social media accounts. I used to follow their updates in real time. Shin Jong Hak's posts are very exaggerated. He is just showing off, basically flaunting his daily workout routine. And during the tough day, and looking forward to a better tomorrow. The key is that he gets a lot of likes, but after looking at it, I started feeling nauseous. As for Kim Suho and Yuyona, they rarely use social media. Rachel's account is managed by the royal family, and Chai Nian's last update was from Clancy Island. It seems my rejection saddened her, but I think she should be able to overcome it on her own. After observing for a while, there was nothing unusual with everyone. During class, the instructor announced the start of the second term. He told everyone that not only would the rankings change, but there would also be new transfer students. Yesterday, there was was a ceremony for placing the transfer students. This is among the top 10 magic academies in the country. If someone wants to become a hero, they would join
forming a cube as a transfer student. Each class gets 20, totaling 200 mages transferring in, of which I remember those who play a significant role in the plot. After the instructor finished introducing, he let the transfer students come in, but while checking how many important characters were in our class, I suddenly recognized one of them, and her face surprised me, for she was Tomer, originally the owner of Ether in the novel. Although her skin color and hair color were different, that face was unmistakably hers. Sure enough, when I opened my watch, I saw new setting changes. Co-author thought Tomer's introduction was too abrupt and her power baseless, so they decided to establish a bond with the main group from the early stages of the novel. After reading the setup, I felt quite helpless because this was purely adding trouble for me. After all, Tomer is no pushover. With the new term starting, my first task was to move into the new dormitory. Seeing the room, several times more luxurious than before, Evangel became very excited. The room had become more spacious. I thought she could live more comfortably too. Being assigned to this dormitory was also because my ranking had improved. The cube assigns accommodations based on rankings, and I was in the upper middle ranks, which I was quite satisfied with. The previous dormitory was too small, and I was worried that Evangel was feeling too confined. As for how to deal with Tomer next, I could only start thinking slowly from now on. The first class of the school year was outdoor training, also meant to bring the original class students and the transfer students closer. The school had even given a code name to this training, called Dangerous Mountain. There are no dangerous monsters in the mountains, but there are various traps and mechanisms. The instructor told everyone to be extra careful, as carelessness could lead to injuries and hospital stays. Next, everyone entered the mountain in pairs. Each group's entrance was also arranged. After the instructor gave the command, all students collectively enter the mountain. However, as they went deeper into the mountain, the weather gradually turned dark and cold. Kim Suho reminded everyone to be careful. If what the instructor said was true, traps could be encountered at any time. However, just after he finished reminding, a magician transfer student was caught in a trap. Kim Suho and the others reacted, but the traps were too fast, and many people were bound into the air. After successfully rescuing the students, Chai Nayun and the others prepared to move locations. But as they moved forward, a creature resembling a female ghost appeared. In just an instant, Chai Nayun and Kim Suho were scared and turned to run away. After reaching the outskirts, they sat down to rest. At this moment, everyone was still shaken by the recent encounter with the female ghost. When they regained their composure, Kim Suho and Chai Nayun praised each other's performance. However, Chai Nayun suddenly thought of something and asked Kim Suho if they were friends. Upon hearing this, Kim Suho said of course. While curious why she asked, Chai Nayun understood Kim Suho's reaction was normal, but I had said we couldn't be friends. She couldn't help but consider another possibility. Could Kim Ha Jin want to cross the line of friendship and move towards a more intimate relationship with her? At this thought, her face turned a shade redder. Just then, I also noticed them. The two groups started interacting. Our team's highest ranks were Lee Jian at 20th and Simon Delick at 41st. Simon Delick said they encountered an illusion barrier and got lost for a long time, until Kim Ha Jin stepped forward to lead the way. Initially, he found it odd, but unexpectedly, I had accurately found the exit. Subsequently, they also discussed the team activities for the second term, and asked Kim Suho and Chai Nayun, who hadn't settled on teammates yet. At that moment, Lee Jian said she wanted to try teaming up with Kim Ha Jin. Since teams are chosen based on performance, Lee Jian thought, since she had to team up with someone with a lower ranking, Kim Ha Jin would be the best among those with three-digit rankings. Her words surprised both Chai Nayun and Simon Delick, but for some reason, Chai Nayun suddenly said that Kim Ha Jin was actually very cold and picky, so she wouldn't recommend Lee Jian choose him. However, Chai Nayun also felt conflicted inside, not knowing why she would say that. Hearing Chai Nayun mention my flaws, Simon Delick took over the conversation, saying I had many negative rumors, such as often leaving the cube to indulge in pleasure. Upon hearing this, Chai Nayun and Kim Suho were clearly unhappy, but Simon Delick didn't notice and continued saying there were violent organizations trying to bribe me. Simon Delick's words completely angered Chai Nayun. Did you witness any of these yourself? Seeing Chai Nayun's furious demeanor, Simon Delick stuttered his reply that he hadn't seen them. If you didn't see it with your own eyes, then don't say such things. Kim Suho believed I'm not that kind of person. Immediately after, Kim Suho ended the topic. Now that everyone had rested enough, they began to continue climbing the mountain. By evening, today's training had also ended. Meanwhile, Yuyona tested the voice-changing effects of her equipment, then put on the prepared outfit. Today was the first meeting of Yuyona's information guild, Falling Blossoms. Falling Blossoms and Essence of the Straight each formed a faction, and only those confirmed as her subordinates could become members of this guild. After arranging things over the holiday, the meeting finally began. Yuyona had already confirmed some of the personnel. It was the first meeting, and everyone was excited. Next, Yuyona outlined the specific direction of the guild. She divided falling flowers into three main sections. Team 1 was responsible for collecting plans or intelligence on competitors, with the primary target being the top-ranking domestic guilds. Team 2 specialized in investigating any new dungeons or the locations of new upper-intermediate grade or above monsters. Team 3 
3 was responsible for executing deeds that must be kept out of the light, such as background checks, kidnappings, etc. When necessary, they even had to carry out assassination missions. Yuyona issued the first task for the third group to investigate the pasts of these five people, but they must not be detected or harm them. After all tasks were assigned, the first meeting of falling flowers ended. In this background check, the other four were just incidental. Yuyona really wanted to know only one thing, what exactly had happened in my past. The next morning, just after I woke up, I found Evangel had run into my room. Seeing her still sound asleep, I didn't disturb her, just stroked her head, and then walked out. At this time, the kitten at home had also woken up. It's a spirit created by Evangel, not an illusion or a temporal form, but an actual kitten made by Evangel's powers. Although its current role is just to be cute, it will definitely give me a great advantage later on. Thinking about this, I cheerfully went to the cafeteria for food. On the way, I suddenly heard someone calling me. Turning around, I didn't expect it to be Yuyona, who had just finished exercising. She was curious about what I was up to, and upon learning I was heading to the cafeteria, Yuyona decided to come along. On the way, she asked me again if I had thought about the future, as now there's just over a year left before I start my internship as a hero. After telling me time was short, Yuyona once again invited me to join the essence of the straight. Honestly, joining Yuyona's guild is practically stepping onto the path of success, but I have a place I fancy, and I immediately told her I was more interested in the Hunters of the Light Guild. Hearing this, Yuyona wasn't angry. Yuyona said she would definitely make me change my mind, as long as she brings back what I have been searching for. She believes my thoughts might change. Hearing this, I was taken aback, not understanding what she meant. I asked Yuyona, but she wouldn't tell me. Just like that, we chatted all the way to the cafeteria. During the conversation, she also mentioned that Lee Jaina had been punished. After eating, it was time for class. Lately, I've been keeping an eye on Kim Suho. He seems to be preparing to venture into a dungeon. In the original novel, on his way to Gamak Mountain after the summer vacation, attracted by the resonance of energy, which drew him to find an undiscovered dungeon where Kim Suho obtained a very important weapon. However, that weapon needs the power of the butterfly dust to awaken, and the problem is that the butterfly dust is still in my possession. With co-author's intervention, this dungeon might change. Considering Kim Suho's safety, I must accompany him. After all, I am well aware of how harsh this world can be on Kim Suho, and perhaps I could find something valuable inside. Time flew by, and today's classes also ended. I had planned to think of a way to deal with Tomer before venturing into the dungeon, but now it seems I have to postpone that. Currently, she has not fully sided with the Jins. As long as we find Tomer's father, there's still a chance to win her over, because Tomer's only goal is to find her missing father and kill him herself. However, I also don't know where Tomer's father is. Plus, with insufficient magic power, using the Book of Truth yields only vague information. I hadn't considered Eugene Hyuk. He is primarily responsible for domestic intelligence. Tomer's father is abroad, so he likely won't be able to find anything. But soon, I thought of someone who could help me. The only friend of Kim Chun-dong and a graduate from a prominent military academy's intelligence course. Thus, I called Kim Hozob in the evening. Kim Hozob then realized it was me, as we hadn't been in touch since the entrance ceremony ended. At that moment, I didn't conceal my intentions and directly expressed my desire to hire him with a substantial reward to find someone. On the other hand, Kim Hozob agreed to help me, though his voice was very soft. Just before hanging up, I asked him if he was being bullied by his superiors. Upon hearing this, Kim Hozob was curious about how I knew. I guess from the way his voice suddenly became quieter. So, I told Kim Hozob that if he was planning to resign soon, I could refer him to a guild where he would surely receive good treatment, given his capabilities. I also told Kim Hozob that the guild was called Falling Blossoms. After the call ended, I couldn't help but think that introducing such a talent to Yona, she should really thank me well. Late at night, Kim Suho was practicing swordsmanship alone. His sword skills had reached perfection, but suddenly Kim Suho stopped his movements. I came out from behind. Seeing me, he then put away his wooden sword. Seeing you work so hard, you aren't planning to raid the dungeon alone. Hearing this, Kim Suho asked me not to tease him. However, the next second I directly mentioned Gamak Mountain. He didn't understand how I knew. Seeing this, I told Kim Suho not to worry, saying I just happened to see it while I was out, as my eyes are always sharp. Afterwards, I also explained my purpose, asking him to take me with him to that dungeon, and at that time, I only needed one-tenth of the reward, and if we got a branch, a few leaves would do. Seeing that I wasn't hiding my intentions at all, Kim Suho also admitted that he indeed discovered a dungeon last week. Originally, he planned to raid it alone. I told him that going alone would definitely be difficult, no matter how you look at it. In response, Kim Suho also said that going alone would be dangerous, but whether he could fully trust me to cover his back was another matter. Immediately, he took off his jacket, wanting to personally verify whether I am truly trustworthy. He asked if he could test me briefly. This development caught me off guard. The gap between Kim Suho and me is too great, and even if he used only one hand, I couldn't guarantee a win. So I said that the open terrain here is disadvantageous for a shooter, and the weapon greatly affects me, making a fair test difficult. But Kim Suho didn't care. He wasn't planning to test my weapon performance. He 
also stated that he didn't need me to win, just that he would stop when he was satisfied. Seeing this, I had no choice but to agree, as it seemed he had wanted to spar with me for a while. Thus, I began to think about how to deal with Kim Suho. Although he was holding a wooden sword, as long as it was covered with magic, my bullets would be useless. A direct confrontation would only lead to a disastrous defeat, thus lowering his opinion of me. To meet Kim Suho's expectations, I had to try a different method, and the clothes he took off gave me an idea. Just as Kim Suho said to let him know when I was ready, I took the opportunity to quietly modify some settings. After quickly writing, I said we could start. Hearing this, he responded that the fight had begun, but no sooner had he spoken than Kim Suho had already approached me. Fortunately, I used bullet time just in time to clearly see the trajectory of Kim Suho's wooden sword and dodged his attack. Kim Suho then reversed his sword handle and continued to chase after me as I evaded. The speed was very fast, and even though I saw the trajectory, I was still slashed by the sword edge. I couldn't keep passively taking hits. Doing so would definitely not earn Kim Suho's approval. Immediately after, I pulled out my pistol and decisively fired. His reaction was quick, slightly shifting his body to dodge my bullet. Fortunately, this also gave me a breather. Kim Suho was very fast, and I could barely dodge his attacks using bullet time, so I couldn't drag this out. Otherwise, once the effect of the skill ended, I would have no chance at all. Next, I needed to gradually guide him into a trap I had set. While I was preparing to shoot, Kim Suho once again swiftly moved behind me. This time I truly didn't react in time, and I quickly used ether, wrapping it around a large tree in front of me to escape Kim Suho's attack range. To this, Kim Suho was not surprised. He said I indeed could still dodge such attacks, but now I had no way out, and Kim Suho wanted to know how I would respond. I was now gambling that his landing spot would be on the jacket I had taken off. The next second, I won the bet. As the trap I set was triggered, Kim Suho was catapulted away, and when he landed heavily on the ground, I had won this test. The jacket I had modified into a trap would push away anyone who stepped on it powerfully, and the effect would disappear after one trigger. At this moment, Kim Suho straightforwardly admitted his defeat. He was seriously observing me, his eyes seeming to see through to one soul. He happily agreed to take me with him. Seeing this, I also breathed a sigh of relief, assuring Kim Suho he could trust me with his back. Meanwhile, in an abandoned factory in City X, Cheek Jung Yang was heartbroken as he smashed a relic because it was very valuable. Drun reassured him that if they used the item brought back from Country B, he could find a way to recover more than twice the money. After speaking, Drun began using a white crystal. Soon, a beam of light shone on the shattered relic, and under the effect of the white crystal, the fragments began to gradually repair themselves, even transforming each fragment into a complete relic. After the production was completed, Drun stated that these swords were replicas made from the fragments, requiring no other steps except the crystal to create some of the relics. After testing, their performance far exceeded that of low-level relics. One relic could produce about 30 swords, and based on the magical volume of the crystal, Drun estimated that about 600 more could be made. Pricing each sword higher than a low-level relic, it would be around 700 million each. If there were 600 swords, they would gain a terrifying amount of wealth. Drun's demonstration was approved by everyone. After praising Drun, Jane also mentioned that besides the white crystal, there was another important matter. The pack horse masters had begun raiding the Den of Devils in City X. The opposition was the next target of the chameleon troop. The captain told all members that the goal of this mission was to plunder the pack horse masters. After some time, and after we parted ways, Kim Suho analyzed the recent fight. My movements seemed incredibly slow, yet I always managed to dodge all attacks, including that mysterious final blow that sent him flying, something Kim Suho couldn't figure out how I did, but he soon let it go. From this contest, Kim Suho guessed that I usually hide my power, probably as a way to protect myself. He originally thought he was the only one who behaved this way, but unexpectedly, he now met a kindred spirit. As he continued walking, Kim Suho suddenly heard a voice nearby, and upon checking, he found Chai Nayun still practicing with her sword. He then went over to say hello, which ended up startling Chai Nayun. Kim Suho asked her if she was practicing swordsmanship, to which Chai Nayun defensively replied that she was just exercising. She then asked Kim Suho what he was doing so late at night. In response, Kim Suho decided to tease her, saying he just met Kim Hajin and talked about her. Chai Nayun's face turned bright red. Seeing her strong reaction, Kim Suho quickly said he was just joking, afraid he might alert others. He then admitted that we sparred briefly, and Chai Nayun didn't understand why he would practice with someone as weak as me. But this time, Kim Suho didn't tell her. Not getting an answer, Chai Nayun turned around to continue her training. Kim Suho then advised her to try not gripping the sword so tightly because doing so could make it difficult to cut through things that could normally be cut. He then demonstrated it for Chai Nayun. Seeing his technique, Chai Nayun wanted to see it again, but Kim Suho told her to relax her grip first. After a while, Chai Nayun also returned to her dormitory. Just now, Kim Suho had mentioned that he could train with her in the future. Now she thought she needed to practice more to find the feeling of relaxing her grip. The more she thought about improving quickly, Chai Nayun suddenly felt a lot of pressure. If she needed to decompress late at night, the only way was
was to play video games. In this world, there is a very popular game among heroes. Many current heroes use it for imaginary training. The game's name is Gladiator of the Century, and its popularity is quite exaggerated. The special feature of this game is that it contains no leveling or item enhancements. Players must rely solely on their instincts and control over their bodies in combat. After logging in, Chai Nian didn't go for ranked matches. She was just there to vent stress, so she looked for someone easy to bully. Quickly, she found her target, someone named Extra 7, with a record of 43 wins and 43 losses, and just a platinum rank. No matter how you look at it, Chai Nian felt this opponent was easy to bully, so she decisively sent a duel request. Unexpectedly, the one called Extra 7 accepted instantly. In the few seconds of preparation before the fight, Chai Nian carefully observed, needing to see how her opponent would make his move. As the sound signaling the start of the match rang out, the battle between the two was about to erupt. Extra 7 charged forward without observing, catching Chai Nian somewhat off guard. Just as she was preparing to counterattack, she found that her opponent had grabbed her clothes and used a dirty trick. It was just a sweeping leg kick, but it made Chai Nian lose her balance, and then Extra 7 took advantage to strike again. The next second, the system displayed Chai Nian's defeat, which infuriated her. Defeated in such a manner, she couldn't easily accept defeat. So, she initiated another duel. What Chai Nian didn't expect was that she would lose the match again. Unwilling to accept defeat, she continued to challenge, and Extra 7 did not refuse. But after many consecutive matches, Chai Nian ended in a disastrous defeat every time. Eventually, she realized that she really couldn't beat this new B. Knowing she would still lose, Chai Nian still asked to play one more game. This time, Extra 7 refused, using sleep as an excuse. Seeing this, Chai Nian hurriedly asked if he always logged on at this time. After getting a confirmed answer, she asked Extra 7 to fight with her every time they meet. Unexpectedly persistent, Extra 7 reluctantly agreed. After logging out, I took off the gaming headset in the dorm. The person I encountered in the game was overly obsessed, which led me to win 7 consecutive matches. I had just logged on to see if random enhancements were effective in the game, and I didn't expect to encounter a battle maniac right away. At this time, I didn't know that person was Chai Nayun. After this test, I also realized that the random enhancement system was better than I had imagined. After enhancing the gaming system, even the virtual characters in the game got stronger. I was about to go to sleep, but then I turned around and found that Evangel was still eating cake. I quickly took the cake away, as eating too much would definitely upset her stomach. When the cake was taken away, Evangel immediately started crying softly. She said she hadn't had enough and asked me to give it back. Even though I told her she could eat more tomorrow, Evangel didn't agree. I didn't expect her to have learned how to be so stubborn now. After putting the cake away, I picked up Evangel and told her that I would bring something tastier in the morning as compensation. Hearing this, Evangel finally stopped crying. After getting her to sleep, I received a message on my watch. When I checked it, it turned out to be a scheduled time from Kim Suho. He had set the day for the dungeon visit to next Friday. So, I replied to Kim Suho that we would meet at the place where we had our contest on that day. The following days were quite mundane, filled with training, attending classes, and the newly added nighttime gaming. Since I had arranged with the player in the game last time, I would log on regularly to spar with her. Today's practice session is over, and it's time for me to go to sleep. Seeing this, Chai Nian happily said goodbye to me. Recently, playing games has also become a routine part of my day, partly because the other player is very polite. Initially, when she challenged me to a fight out of the blue, I thought I had encountered a weirdo. Now I suddenly remember, I still don't know how to read her gaming nickname. Thinking carefully about the strange name, and seeing two characters similar to Nayun, I couldn't help but associate it with Chai Nayun. However, I quickly dismissed the thought, as it seemed a bit far-fetched. Time quickly moved to next Friday, and today Kim Suho watched Chai Nian's training. Kim Suho also praised her movements for being much more natural than before. Chai Nian mentioned that she had been playing a game recently, which helped improve her swordsmanship. Kim Suho had heard of a game. Chai Nian also said that she met an expert in the game who not only was willing to train with her but also had strong close combat skills. Kim Suho thought that to receive such praise from Chai Nian, the person might be an active hero, but Chai Nian said she had asked, and the answer was no. At this moment, I arrived there too, and hearing my voice, Chai Nian turned around. I was curious what the two of them were doing. Kim Suho was about to say that he had been practicing swordsmanship with Chai Nian recently, but Chai Nian quickly stopped him and said it was just a chance encounter today. Her words left Kim Suho quite puzzled, but seeing Chai Nian's demeanor, he didn't continue. Then I told him we could depart. Hearing this, Chai Nian was curious about where we were going, but we didn't tell her. After saying goodbye to her and encouraging her to keep up her training, Chai Nian suddenly realized something was amiss. Noticing that Kim Suho and I seemed to have become quite familiar, coupled with Kim Suho's earlier mention of a conversation about her, Chai Nian grew even more curious about what exactly we were going to do. Very concerned, she secretly followed us and eavesdropped on our conversation. However, when she heard me asking Kim Suho about her recent status, Chai Nian was startled, and her face turned red on the spot. She even dared 
would not listen to what I was about to ask. Before long, we entered a nearby restaurant. During the meal, Kim Suho and I confirmed the location of the dungeon, since it was within the bounds of City X. He reminded me to be cautious as it was one of the most dangerous areas in the country. When a magical explosion occurred, much of the area's terrain turned into steep mountains, so the western side of City X is strictly off-limits to ordinary people. Gamak Mountain happens to be near there. While I am the one who designed this world, there are a lot of undiscovered hidden pieces. There are many key items that must not fall into the hands of villains, but due to the dangers, there are still several places I do not have the courage to search alone. But if Kim Suho helps, we might be able to secure it before the villains do. At this stage, he should already be stronger than an intermediate grade hero. If we take away what should belong to the villains beforehand, we can avoid a lot of trouble. That would make things safer in the future. Thinking this, I find myself increasingly approving of Kim Suho. During the meal, we considered what to bring, but Kim Suho probably doesn't have much money, so I need to prepare extra equipment and food. At that moment, a person wrapped up tightly also came into the restaurant and her outfit immediately caught my eye. After noticing my gaze, she quickly turned around and then went to pick up her pre-ordered food. I recognized who it was and decided to play a trick on her. Thus, I called out Yuyona's name. Hearing this, she hurriedly claimed I had the wrong person. But upon hearing the voice, Kim Suho also recognized it was Yuyona. We invited her to join us for a meal, but Yuyona didn't want others to know she really liked hamburgers and rice soup. After being discovered, she was completely flustered and quickly left with her food. However, Yuyona ran off so fast that she forgot to pay. Seeing the bewildered look on the owner's face, I said I would pay for her. This incident had a big impact, and Yuyona didn't dare to make a contact with me for three days. After we were ready, today we officially set out to raid the dungeon. After teleporting to City X, I met up with Kim Suho. He then led the way personally. Soon, we entered the region of Gamak Mountain, but after a long walk, we still hadn't reached our destination. I remained vigilant all along the way, as Gamak Mountain is near the restricted area. After climbing further for a while, Kim Suho stopped. Then he told me we had arrived. This place is very hidden, and even knowing the location, it's hard to find. Moreover, the entrance is narrow, so escape would be difficult if there were any dangers inside. Kim Suho wanted to know if I was sure I wanted to go in. Naturally, I intended to, and I told him not to underestimate my shooting skills. This time, just in case, I specifically spent SP to create light bullets. However, if there are upper intermediate grade boss monsters, it would likely be up to Kim Suho to handle them. When it was time to enter, I asked him to hold my hand. Kim Suho was puzzled why we needed to do this, and I explained that it was very dark inside, and rashly turning on a flashlight could provoke spirit monsters. Hearing this, he understood my intention. We then decisively entered the cave. Unlike the narrow entrance outside, it was actually quite spacious inside. After walking for a short while, I suddenly sensed something was off and stopped. Using Thousand Mile Eye, I discovered another passage leading into the cave, meaning the dungeon had another entrance, but I didn't remember this setup, so I continued deeper to investigate with Thousand Mile Eye, and unexpectedly, in the distance of the other passage, I saw two people slowly walking towards us. Kim Suho was curious about what was happening, but I asked him to stay quiet as I needed to concentrate fully on observing. From their appearances, it was hard to tell who they were, but the aura they emitted was definitely not that of the good guys. After a short wait, sure enough, I received a new message, a change notification from co-author. He thought that the rewards of the Gamak Mountain Dungeon were too generous for its difficulty, so he changed this dungeon to a hidden level connected to the Den of Devils of City X. After reading the notification, I understood the current situation. The dangerous Den of Devils, which was originally unrelated, was now connected to the Gamak Mountain Dungeon. I then asked Kim Suho what today's date was, and after learning learning it was the 14th, I finally noticed something was off. Since today was the day the Pack Horse Masters was fully raiding the Den of Devils, these two must be scouts from the Pack Horse Masters, likely here first. Seeing my expression change, Kim Suho quietly asked what was happening. This time, I told him that someone was coming towards us. Upon hearing this, Kim Suho found it hard to believe. While I became even more worried, the Pack Horse Masters is a relatively strong entity within the Jin organizations, and they usually use false identities that are at least intermediate grade heroes. Even with Kim Suho current strength, it would be difficult to handle. As I considered whether to continue raiding the dungeon, those two seemed to be considering returning. After they finished discussing, they began to head back the way they came. Seeing this, I breathed a sigh of relief. All we needed to do was quickly defeat the boss monster. To find the boss's location quickly, I immediately used the power of the stigma to activate Thousand Mile Eye. Looking deep into the dungeon, I then saw a wall with writing on it, which should be the location of the boss monster. I told Kim Suho the route and suggested we make a quick decision as those people might return. Turn. Kim Suho agreed decisively. Meanwhile, in the Den of Devils of City X, the Pack Horse Masters' team was almost done with their raid. The chairman, Kim Jin Kyung, was asking others if they had found anything else. At that moment, the two individuals mentioned over the phone that they had reached a secret passage to Gamak Mountain. Hearing about a hidden level, Kim Jin Kyung became interested and instructed them to continue exploring.
exploring and not to regroup, Yi and the others would head over immediately. After the call, Kim Jin Kyung informed the other members that the scout team had found a hidden level and they were going to clean it out completely. Upon hearing this, one man was curious about where the scout team was currently. Hearing that the others had gone ahead to search, the man simply remarked, missing two people, seeing him still standing there. The other members urged him to hurry up and take action. Unexpectedly, the next second, the man suddenly opened a teleportation channel. The chairman was puzzled about what he was doing and why he was opening an artificial teleport point. Hearing the chairman's question, the man appeared somewhat angry, as this wasn't a Jin's teleportation, but a power that could connect to nearby spaces, called Phase Shift. Kim Jin Kyung was also angry that his subordinate hadn't closed the teleportation yet. However, the man in question was actually an undercover agent in the Pack Horse Masters, his real identity being Khalifa of the Chameleon Troop, who possesses a blue card. Just as Kim Jin Kyung was about to confront him, with a gentle wave of Khalifa's hand, the next second, the other members froze as a black long spike suddenly appeared from the teleportation channel and pierced through Kim Jin Kyung's head. Immediately after, his body began to slowly melt. Before the people of the Pack Horse Masters could react, their chairman was dead on the spot, even turning into a bizarre cloud of smoke and dispersing. The person who struck was the captain of the Chameleon Troop, her power as brutally strong as ever. However, the captain did not finish off the remaining people, but used her power to knock all the djinns unconscious. She did this also for the sake of stock prices, so she had to spare their lives, considering the Chameleon Troop also held many shares in the Pack Horse Masters. Next, Khalifa was about to check out the hidden level, but the captain told him to just wait here. Khalifa was curious if something unexpected had happened. 